have several books here I want to read from in a little bit. Um, and I do have a, a few Bibles here if anybody would like a Bible so you can see this. And I usually say, or I have a statement, I say seeing is believing. And when I say that is, um, this is sort of a repeat from last Sunday, which was a repeat from the Sunday before that. And uh, which was a repeat from the Sunday before that. So it's kind of like it, you, when you come in the middle and didn't hear what I said last week or the week before or whatever, it's kind of line upon line and layer upon layer. So when you come in the middle of a layer, you know, you may wonder what I mean when I say some of the things that I say. So uh, just all I can say is just bear with it and just let it resonate with you. If it does, fine. Don't. And, you know, I always suggest just put it on a shelf and think about it at a later date and just see if it does resonate you, resonate with you at that time. But to start with, I want to uh, read some notes that I wrote this morning. And uh, in these notes, I use several scripture that uh, that we quote from. And actually, uh, these notes are what, three or four hours old. So I had no idea the songs that you guys were going to sing. I didn't know you were going to sing the songs that you sang. But you'll hear me quote some from your songs in these notes. So I you know, call that a confirmation or a coincidence, I guess. So, and that coincidence, that's, that's a architectural term. Most people don't know that's an architectural term. Because you see where the roof coincides with the outer wall, that joint, that resting place is called in architect a coincidence. It's on purpose. It's, it's purposely designed to fit. So that's pun, you know, that's information that many times things we don't know that uh, we use ideas and things that we do know, but we know them in our heart. And so there are things that's, you know, if you let them, if you let certain truths outside your boxes, if you let them resonate with you, you'll find that they agree with you. <laughs> so, even though they're outside, even though they're outside your box or outside the way you think. But I'll use, I'll use a lot of scripture, but not the way that most of us have been taught to use scripture. And... Uh, by that, I just simply mean the Bible for me has been for the last 25, close to 30 years, more a book about biology and the physical structure of the body, which I think all of us know the Bible says that the body is the temple of God. I think we know that, but we don't know that. We say that, but we don't know what does that mean when it says it's the temple of God. Well, just exactly like the ancient temples that were built, they were actually built on the structure of physical anatomy. And which the temples, the few temples that are still standing that are 2,000 years or older, which are still standing, anybody can look at those temples now and look at the dimensions, even though they have a lot of astrological dimensionality about them, they are built as a structure of the physical body. And there are, there are a plethora of books, if any would like to know that information. But in 326, when the Roman church organized what's called Christianity, as we know it today, is not what it was prior, prior to 326. It wasn't at all that. Prior to 326, it was more of the Christ, which was a Greek term that the Hellenistic Jews began to use around th between three and 400 B.C. So the Essenes or Hellenistic Jews were called the Christians. And then in 326 the Council of Nicaea took those writings and began to try to make those writings that were always allegorical, symbolic, basically built on signs and symbols, not literal and not historical. The Roman church made them literal historical. So for the last 14 to 1600 years, we have been under the depression, suppression, and deception of that church. So the majority of, quote, Christians think under that mindset. 
not because they want to, but because they don't know any different. They've just been taught that. And so, um, so it, it, it's that way. So many times it's hard to say something or say the uh, contrary truth to what you know people are, th are thinking or been taught. And uh, because there's a lot of offense in things, religion is very mean and hostile. You, you should know that. And uh, I can remember, I can remember back before we built this and we had a long, a long sanctuary here and we would have, gosh, 150, 200 people here. And I can remember I was preaching, this has been 25, 27 years ago, and I was up here preaching with a couple hundred people, and I was preaching no rapture. And we had two guys here that after the service, they were making their way to me to fight me. These were bona fide, tongue-talking, Bible-toting Christians. They wanted to fight me because of what I had said during that message. And of course, we had some big guys back then, young guys, they just kind of got them and escorted and took them outside. Which I wasn't opposed to fighting them. I just didn't want to do it in the building in here. But I've run into that a lot over the years where people, when you say certain things contrary to their religious ideology and their beliefs and their box, they get very irate and angry and upset. And they sometimes want to revert to fighting. And of course, last week I mentioned when I had my tire business, I had some Baptist preachers use this word. Now, this is not, this is just their words. They said, I don't give a damn what the Bible says. I know what we believe is the Baptist. <laughs> and, you know, and I, that, I say that in love toward these people. That's just a mindset. And it's a, and that's why I say religion is the problem we have in the world today. That's why there's so much dissension, the division, and fighting, and wars. It's rooted in religion and these kind of ideologies and different belief systems. So I'm going to start in Genesis chapter 28 or somewhere there about, but I want to read these notes to you and... Uh, Pray that we have an ear. You remember Jesus said these words, if you have an ear to hear and an eye to see. Now, obviously, that's not literal. Hello? So it has to be something beyond literal. It has to be something that's spiritual. It has to be something meta, above, or beyond. And of course it is. He wasn't talking about if you really had little ears and little eyes. He was talking about, do you have the ability to see outside your box? Can you hear something contrary to what you have been taught? That's, and that's where the truth really lies at. It doesn't lie within the confines of your box. It lies when you tear your box down. And you don't have a box. And that's the best place to be. Because what a church should be and what it has become over the last 1,700 years are totally two completely different things. The church should be a place where I come to learn more about myself. Because it's about me. Every If you're the temple of God and God lives inside you and you don't know that, you don't know how to really live your life. And it's not that when you do know that, that all, all these things have to change in your life. It's that you will tweak the things that fit you and serve you and your community to a greater extent. And if we could ever learn it, it's not fitting in the I do's and I don'ts. I should and I shouldn't. I would and I wouldn't. It don't fit in that at all. It fits in your heart. And when, you, when we learn to really, really tune into my heart and follow my heart, we're a little different ballgame. So... <clears throat> I wrote these words, the mas to, to, to master, and the word master, when I'm talking about the word master, to master means to study or to know something. And so, to master or to study and to know signs, symbols, allegories, parables, myths, types, and shadows, and more. Now those, those are terms we are sometimes aren't even familiar with. But Genesis chapter 1 tells you right out of the starting gate. Genesis chapter 1 verse 14 begins to tell you that the whole astrological circuit is put there as a sign, a symbol for you and me. It's put there to show me, me. But we don't know that. I mean, you're... I'm going back nearly 40 years. I've been pastor for 37 years, and I'm going back 
nearly 40 years in my early old studies, and I remember how that early on in Christianity, they taught me stay away from astrology. That's of the devil. When the Bible is an astrological book, everything about it, it's just about on every page. If you're the temple, and the temple is in the sky, and that that's in the sky reflects itself on this that's on the earth, then the temple, both out there and the temple here, are a resemblance of each other. That's why the old aphorism, as above, so below. As without, so within. But we have, we've had that taken away from us. Those different things are stolen from us. So, I've been saying for years and years that a myth, when a myth is really told, and one of my passions is life, in life is that I want to know how to tell a myth. A myth is a fabulous story. It's just exactly like Paul said in Galatians chapter 4. He said that Abraham and Sarah are allegories. And if we, could, if we would really associate ourselves with that ideology, Abraham and Sarah aren't literal. They weren't referring to a historical, literal man and woman and their progeny. If they're not, if they're, if they are allegories, then they border in the same school and thought as a myth. But when you can tell that story and you can understand that story to the intent the story is meant to be told, it ignites something inside your heart and it awakens you from the inside out. And therefore it energizes you and it empowers you to be your true self and not the false self that we all try to be. So to master signs and symbols, allegories, parables, myths, types and shadows and so forth, it's the only way to understand the mysteries of the ancient writings or the scrolls or the different ciphers. And to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, and actually the word God in the kingdom of God, the word God is El. In ancient Hebrew you had several different words that were used for the one English translated word, God. You had Elohim. Elohim is plural. So it should be, every time you see Elohim, it should actually have an S, meaning gods. Actually, it's referring to the wheel of powers, P-O-W-E-R-S. Or in other words, the 12-spoke astrological wheel are the powers of the whole complete God. But when you're talking about L, you reduce it to that singular L, it just simply means power. So it's referring to one spoke of the wheel. So if I can understand my birth chart, I'm on February the 19th, that's when I was empowered. That's when El empowered God, empowered me, and built me to be its dwelling place. And you, wherever you fit in that wheel, and you all do, everybody fits somewhere in the wheel. We just don't understand the wheel. We don't understand how to balance the wheel. We, you know, because of, again, religion. So, the mystery of the kingdom of God within you. In other words, inside your being. And I'll, and I'll give a quote. This is one of the things of the song that you talked about. Luke 17. Luke 17, 20. Jesus said, don't go over there looking for it. And don't go down there looking for it. That's exactly where they're looking for it today. The Christians are either looking in the sky for Jesus to come back. Or they're looking over to the Middle East. And they're saying, that's where it's at. And the scripture clearly said, don't do that. I mean, Jesus said, don't do that. Why? Clearly, the kingdom of God is inside me. You can touch yourself. And touch your heart. Touch your very the core of your being and say, God is in here. God is in here. But we, we do not have a working knowledge of that. We think that we're crazy, or someone's crazy, if I said, I am as God is. Huh? You think you're God? Well, what else could I not be? I mean, I have to be God. I have to be what God is because He said in Genesis 1.26, He made me as His likeness, as it's, as it's very similar to you. So that's what I am. That's who I am. I mean, you know, I didn't say I act like I'm what I am. <laughs> Learning to act like who I really am is the walk of knowing myself. I mean, we have these things so messed up in religion that just because my walk is not measuring up to who I am, if I constantly look in the mirror of myself, I will constantly tweak my walk. Which is a progressive thing. 
And that goes to Beverly's beautiful song, powerful song. My goodness. How many of us, if not all of us, are constantly guilty, caught in judging that prostitute or that person or that, 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 that. The guy that cut me off. You know, had, you know pulled out in front of you, whatever. You know how you know how we are. So that the gospel of Luke tells us real clearly the kingdom is inside. Then a gospel that the Roman church took away from us that was dug up and refound here about 50, 60 years ago, the gospel of Thomas, which they thought they had destroyed all of them. They thought they had burned all of this. You see, the Roman church, or in other words, the Christian church, it went about from 326 point up until the 14th and 15th and 16th centuries killing, plundering, and destroying any ideology contrary to what they were trying to establish, which they were trying to make a literal history book out of a mystery book. And they did that by destroying any material. They go destroy the Alexandrian library. Wouldn't we, wouldn't we love to have that? My idea is it's still somewhere in the Vatican Library. That'd be my idea, is they didn't destroy some of this precious information they just incarcerated and hide it from us as they have done so long. But the Gospel of Thomas says these very words, just like Jamie changed her song. It says, don't look to the sky for the kingdom because if you look to the sky for the kingdom, the birds will precede you. It says, don't look to the sea or to the oceans because if you look there, the fish will precede you. But look within yourself and outside yourself. There you will find the kingdom of God. That's not hard. That's clear. That's a confirmation. And you know, or you may not know, that there was, a, during that 326 vine and killing, a lot, of different, a lot of different bishops were killed because they wouldn't come along with what the Roman church was trying to do under the leadership of Constantine and the Nicene Council and Creed. They wouldn't come along with that, so they killed them. I mean, that was Constantine's mode of operandi. See, that's how he operated. You don't agree with me, we'll kill you. He had just killed his wife two years before that. He had just killed his son the same year. Now, that's the kind of person that set up Christianity as we know it today. That's the founding father who was the, who was the emperor of Rome. But And that, you know, that kind of information, sometimes it... it gets me in the goad. <laughs> kind of gets me angry. So I'm spiritually angry. <laughs> like Jesus was in the temple. I want to tear up some stuff. <laughs> gets me that deception has so grabbed hold of us and cut off our eyes to see, or blinded it, and cut off our ear to hear so that we will not even give an ear to these, these ideas and these things that, that, are, that are ready. They're there. They're just everywhere. So the masters are the architects who built the great temples. And by the way, the temple of Solomon, which is mentioned, I think it's in 1 Chronicles and 1 Samuel, the only other places it's even mentioned in the entire Bible. The word temple there in Hebrew is this. It, it's this. Uh, it's this glyph right here. I will put this up for you. This is called a. Uh, this is called the Beth, uh, Beth or Vaith, either either way or both ways, Beth or Vaith. <coughs> this what because it show up a little bit better. That's the Beth or Vaith, and it's number two, and we we mostly know of it as Beth. You know, like Beth. El, you know what I'm saying when Beth, Hannah, exactly. We know, and what would we call Beth? How would we? House? House. house. And that's what, it, that's what it means, house or container. It's number two, and this is the first symbol. It's called the Alif. It's number one. It always refers to God. So when you're spelling <laughs> Elohim, that's the first blip or the first symbol, which is a sign. All of the Hebrew... Characters in the alphabet are called signs 
are symbols or glyphs. And it's an understanding as you understand these signs and symbols and glyphs, then you will be able to understand them put together to form what we call a word. So like for instance, if we're going to say house, Beth or Baith. So when it talks about the temple of Solomon, it's talking about the Beth or the container of the soul. That's the sun. I think that in that Spanish for sun, S-O-L, soul, Spanish mm -hmm. for sun. Soul, old man. The house of the sun. That's basically, that would be you and me. So the masters, the architects who built these great temples or houses or containers, they built them from this root word, bana. So this word, bait, or Beth comes from another root word called bana, and that word means to obtain children. Because if we don't obtain children, in other words, without reproduction, we, we would be here. Nothing would be here. I mean, if the earth did not continually reproduce itself, then we would none of us be here. So that's what that word bana, it means to actually to obtain children. That's the root of this word. Uh, but the great temples, they, were, they did not build them so people could come and sing how great thou art, or just as I am, or kneel at the cross. They didn't build them for that reason. None of them were built. We think they were built for a house of worship where everybody would come and then they had this great big orchestra. Truly they did have big orchestras. But they were built for schools of learning. They were places where the initiates came and were taught the mysteries of God. They, they were taught the mystery of God, which is the temple, the body, which you are. They taught you how to be you. That's what they were about. They weren't about coming as we call the temple or the church or the place we go where the preacher beats us up or did, does this. They were actually built and they were constructed. And there are many of them, the skeletons are still standing there. Some of them even the ceilings in the temples which do have the astrological design built in those structures. And many of the ancient cathedrals that we still have, six, seven, eight, nine hundred years, were built on the same identical purposes. So there were places where you come and you were initiated. What does it mean to be initiated? It actually means to be baptized. That's the same thing, to be baptized. You were introduced into the teachings about yourself. You were introduced to your own biological, anatomical makeup. And that's what, the, that's what all the writings were about. Know yourself. Man, know thyself. Right above the temple. Before you, right when you come under the door. Know thyself. So they did not build them so people could come and sing to a God out there somewhere. They built them as places of teaching and learning centers so people could know the power, the L, that's within themselves. And of course there I would quote Luke and I would quote the Gospel, the, the Gospel of Thomas. And so I said all of that because I had started teaching some things here a few weeks back on dreams. How many of you have a dream? Everybody dreams, right? Well, sure you do. And so I wanted to share some things about dreams because this is common when you see this in Scripture. You'll see this on a consistent basis. So I want you to, if you will go with me to Genesis chapter 28. And this is a story that most of you are familiar with. And I know that you are, but I want you to look at it with me for just a minute. And uh, Jacob... Everybody say Jacob. 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 Actually, the word Jacob and the person of Jacob is a typology or a symbol or allegory of your physical, carnal, natural man. In other words, he's not just a, not a real character. He's a symbol. He's a sign. But it's the sign of you. So you have to associate yourself with Jacob. So when you read about Jacob, you can read about yourself. So when you read about some of the things that he did or he does, then you'll catch yourself doing some of the same things. And we do. And how many of you remember what Jacob did? He grappled with this angel. That's what the scripture says, that he wrestled. Actually, the word wrestle in Hebrew doesn't mean 
that he actually had combat and he, he, you know, he maneuvered around and was a little stronger or got a better chokehold on this angel. And finally, that wrestling actually is a word that means that he was, he was exposed to a phenomenal light show. And what the light show did touched the marrow or the core or the heart of his being and changed his walk. And God said, you're not called Jacob. You're called Israel. And if you look at that word, actually that word is supposed to be broken down like this. Is, which is female energy. It always comes first. Female energy. Israel. Ra was the Egyptian sun god, and it all mean, always means male energy. And then El is power. So when, so when we look at this word, Israel, we know that this physical man, myself, has now been transformed or changed to my true self, which is my Israel, my feminine, natural, my masculine natural side empowered by Elohim or El. So now you know what Israel is now. Now is a place that all Christians they think, wow, if we if we honor Israel and we go over there and bless the Jews and God's going to bless us. Yeah, that's what y'all believe. It's not referring to that at all. It doesn't mean that. It's actually talking about you. It's talking about yourself. So here's this story, and I want you to look at this story with me, and I'm not going to go a whole lot into it, but I want to point out something about this. Verse 10 of Genesis chapter 28, And Jacob went out from Beersheba. Actually, Beersheba means this. It means the well of seven. The well of seven. Seven is one of the most profound and prominent glimpses or Characters in Scripture. Seven. And the reason it is, is because the number seven not only means completion and perfected, it is the symbol of the physical body. The physical body is built when the seed penetrates the egg and creates that embryo. That embryo is built with seven endocrine glands. It makes it look just like a little worm. If you can see it under my, that's exactly what it looks like, a little bitty worm. Seven, those are the seven yawns or the seven days of creation. Everything in Scripture from Genesis 1 all the way through Revelation, which Revelation has the number 7 mentioned in it 47 or 48 times. It's a, the book of Revelation has been in and out, in and out, in and out of this compilation we call the King James Bible or we call the Bible. It's been in and out, in and out because the church, the, the Roman church, the Christian church had such a problem with it knowing how we're going to make it literal. So finally they tweaked a lot of words in it, twisted and manipulated a lot of words and changed a lot of words, which it would blow your mind if you could see some of the changes. Not, not near all of them, just a few of the changes that would blow your mind. It would literally blow your mind to see those things and realize, wow. And that's why I tell people, I don't blame you if you can't study the Bible and you can't read the Bible. That, don't, feel, don't take a back seat to anybody. If you can follow your heart, you'll do great. You can do great. Now, I've spent my life, my adult life, just about studying the Bible so that now it has become the most marvelous biological, anatomical book I can get in my hands because what I see in it now is not anything near what the modern clergy sees, period. And I know that first place right out of the starting gate. And I'm not trying to convince anybody that. I know what I see. You know? And so when I know what I see, I know what I see. So Beersheba actually means the well of seven, or this is Beersheba. You know, you say, well, that's a place somewhere over there. No, they named a place somewhere over there that. But this was written here in typology and in mythological mystery form. It's the body. It's the well of seven, or it's also Beersheba means the, the well of life. And notice what it says. He says that, and Jacob went out from Beersheba Toward Haran. Haran actually means to be in, it be in a place of elevation. Or it's actually saying, I'm going out of my lower carnal physical nature into my higher nature. So Haran actually means I'm going into the enlightenment of my real being. 
And what happens to him when he gets there? Let's look and see what happens. And he lighted upon a certain place and he tarried there all night because the sun was set and he took, took the stones of that place and put them for his pillow. Now that's the most bizarre story I have ever read simply because I've, I've camped even when our girls were real little. We camped we used to go out in the woods and the one thing that we would pick up because then we just used tents. But the one thing I would always do when I'm out there getting ready to put my tent up is I would walk around like this. You know what I'm doing? I'm trying to find rocks. You know why? Because I don't want them where I'm laying. And I don't think you do either. And I sure didn't find me a good smooth round one to lay my head on. Now I'm sure you would and I'm sure that this character right here would. Or would he? Is it saying something different than that? Well, I challenge you I'll tell you, he's saying something different than trying to find a hard rock to lay his head on. God. But we buy that stuff. Why? Because we don't understand the beauty of the myth. We don't understand the phenomena of the story. You know, I did that teaching series out in College Station, Texas here. Gosh, it's been, I don't know, three or four or five years ago on uh, uh, Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. And that book was written with, from a guy who wrote that book in 1899 and published it in 1902 and it became a phenomenon because it was based off the Theosophy, the great movement that was established by Madame Blavatsky. And what Madame Blavatsky was saying in Theosophy was that all religions, basically, all over the world said exactly the same thing if you had an eye to see them. If you could take Krishna or if you could take Buddha, or if you could take Jesus, and you realize they all were symbolic characters, meaning a greater self, a greater you. It was about you. All of them have always been about that. But we didn't, we didn't know that. And so he wrote that, The Wizard of Oz, and I did a teaching on The Wizard of Oz, and how that when Dorothy, if you, if you remember what happened to Dorothy in the beginning of, of the movie, how many of you have seen the movie? A dozen times that we all, and I recommend you watch it again and again. It's one of the most symbolic, profound movies you're ever going to watch in our day and time. But it's telling you the story of the journey to yourself. How did she start? Do y'all remember? She started on her bed in a dream. The story is a dream. It's all taking place in a dream. That's basically what I'm going to show you about these characters in here because there are characters in the Bible that they are having dreams. And you do too. How many of you remember them and how many of you forget them? Most, mm -hmm. Forget them most of you? Forget them. Yeah, okay. I, I know I do. A lot of times I forget. Some of them I remember. Some of them I don't. Ladies, is, he took stones and he made them a pillow and he put them down uh, for a place to sleep. And he dreamed. Here you go. He dreamed. And behold, a ladder set up on the earth. The top of it reached to the heavens. And behold, the angels ascending and descending upon it. And behold, the Lord stood above it. And he said, I, the Lord God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac, and uh, the land whereof I give you. And actually, this word land is the, it's the Hebrew word is found. First place it's found is in uh, Genesis 1.1. And it's this word right here. Alif Resh Tov. And it doesn't mean dirt, but it's translated earth. Actually, it is, a, it is a word that describes the phenomenon of the makeup of the physical body out of fire and light. That's basically what this word describes. Just exactly like heaven, sheen, the Hebrew word for heaven, sheen, mem, yod, mem, that word has two divisions. It has waters above and waters below. Both mems, mem 40 and mem 600, refer to water. Or water refers to materiality. Everything on the earth is basically from water. Take the water off, you ain't going to have nothing. So you have waters above have to do with the waters that deal with uh, the system in your, bo your body called the blood system, right? Because if you take ocean water... When you, if you go to the hospital and they put you on saline solution, you know what that is? How many of you know what that is? Saline solution. Mm -hmm. It's salt water. 
which is the same chemical makeup as your blood. I, I mean, Google it. Ask God. By the way, they're going to change Amazon's name to God. Did y'all know that? That's just a joke. Y'all can lie. I'm just teasing. Sheen bim and yod bim. This is, this is referring to salt water, and this is referring to fresh water. So your whole lip mode system, which makes up 60-70% of your body, runs on a fresh water system. And the two, when they are put together in a physical body, they make that physical body energetic live. They cause it to heal. This is a picture of the body. Heaven is the body. It's that above, this and this. It's, this is the body. But we didn't realize that. Nobody ever taught us to, how to break these glyphs down and really see what they were saying. But when you break them down and you start to see what they're saying, you're like, oh my goodness, this is talking about me. <laughs> it's showing me how to, how to be myself, how to be who I am and what I am. So he has a dream. And you know, I'm not going to get into the dream, the ladder set up above, and the, and the DNA and the spiral column, how that this is going up and down. And again, it's something inside your body, but it, it is. So for that, those that have an eye to see it or an ear that can hear it, then you'll, you'll notice it and you'll begin to grasp it. So go with me now to Genesis chapter 35. And now all of this is, uh, is astrological. Uh, I'm sorry, 37. 35 is actually where Jacob... Got the name changed. He saw this light show, and that light show touched the marrow of his being, and his name was changed. But look with me in Genesis 37 and uh, verse 5. And we're going to a different character here. Actually, I wanted to, let's see if I even wrote that down on the page. I don't think I did. Uh, let me find that in here real quick. Yeah, Joseph. Joseph. And Joseph, the name Joseph, actually, so we just got through looking at Jacob. Jacob was changed to Israel. Now we're looking at Joseph. And I want you to pay attention to the things about these characters. They're dreamers. You are. And that's on purpose. That's a design of God. How many of you have noticed that when you're your dreams, you're Superman? Or superwoman. Have you ever noticed that you do really? Don't you? You can you can walk on water. You can fly in the air. You can just do. You can walk through a wall. You can be here and you can be there, all just like that. You know, in your dream, you're just unlimited. You're Superman. And uh, those dreams are phenomenal because of the things they do to the physical body and how they awaken the chemical drugstore that you really are. So that you don't have to go down here to uh, CVS or Walgreen or somewhere to get your chemicals that you take. You already got them. You already got them inside your body. We just know how to access them. And many times your dreams do that. Many times your dreams access this chemical drugstore so that it can release things in your body so it can repair your body from you trying to kill it all day. Because we do. I mean, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, we, we, we consume, and our body is all the time saying, don't do that to me, don't do that. And we do it, we constantly do it because we're just not paying attention or not listening to, we're not listening to our, our heart or the inner part. So verse 37, and verse 5, chapter 37, verse 5, and Joseph dreamed a dream. Joseph is a dreamer. I want to read you the definition of the name Joseph, uh, this is what his name means from his Hebrew. It actually means from perfection unto perfection. So he's coming from a higher place to go to a, a higher place. So the story of him is about that. But I want you to watch this story and how, and his, uh, just read you some of the things about Joseph from this. Joseph is especially representative of the realm of forms. He was clothed with a coat of many colors. Actually, he actually had seven. Just exactly like it tells you in Psalms, I think it's Psalms 137 or 139, it tells you that you were woven, and you can read this out of the Amplified Translation, I think, in the Living Bible, both will give you a really clear definition of what it says in Hebrew. 
says that you were woven in your mother's womb or you were built in your mother's womb like a multicolored garment or a garment of seven colors. The same colors as a rainbow. So he, this says about him, he was clothed with a coat of multiple colors, actually seven of them. He was a dreamer and interpreter of dreams. The phenomenon was his field of action. Among the primal faculties of the mind, Joseph represented imagination. In Genesis chapter 4, when the child is completed in the womb, that's what Genesis chapter 2 and 3 is all about. It's about the embryo growing in the womb. The, uh, the four rivers that comes out of the gardens deals with the heart and its, and its construction and how it's built. Uh, the Hebrew word Satan or the serpent deals with the Kundalini or the Caduceus. The Caduceus is a picture of two serpents on a pole. The pole is actually, the pole is your backbone and the two serpents are going up to the top. Um, I read one. Use my red one, but I don't see my red one. That is, that's the serpents on the pole, and this is where they're at here. They they go from the sacrum, the pump at the base of your spine, the sacrum that pumps the fluid, which is the Christ. It's an oil. It pumps this oil right here, right there, and it does it. It does it two ways. It does it when you move. It does it every time you breathe. So the pump is pushing oil back up. That's what it's designed to do. What's it designed to do? It pushes this oil. That's the Christ. It's called the Christos, which in Hebrew is called the Mishiach. It's called the King or the Anointed One. Why? Because this oil goes up here into your higher self where you can imagine a thing. And in Genesis 3 and 4, at the end of the third chapter, when it says, and they were... That says they were driven out. That's how the King James translated. They were driven out of the garden. And there were, what was it? It said that there were uh, flaming swords and chariots to keep them from coming back into the garden. You remember that? Yeah. <laughs> like verse of chapter 3. Yeah. It's just totally reversed in Hebrew. It doesn't say that. Actually, it says that these were flaming swords. They are actually the 24 elders in Roman in Revelation chapter 4, the 24 elders sitting around the throne, the 12 paired cranial nerve coming out here, 12 pair, 12 major nerves coming off your right and left brain, your male and female, your Adam, your Eve, your Abram and Sarah, Sarah Brum. See that? Sarah Brum, Sarah Abram. Right and left, male, female. Coming off of this, and all of this is working, the beauty of this physical body, that's what Satan is. I so, it's so sad that we don't know this. That's the Satan of, of Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. That, that's the one, that's the serpent on the pole. The serpent on the pole is the caduceus. And they understood that. Why? Because they're taking you from higher consciousness to higher consciousness. To, to elevate yourself through the ability of imagination. That's what the karub, the, the Hebrew karub, actually it means the ability to imagine a thing. And so what those guys with those flaming swords, that's the synapses firing in your brain saying, here's the way. It's not saying, you can't come in here. Here's the way to your true self. Here's the way to you to go into yourself. Here's the way to find who you are. We've had religious stand out there with the sword saying, no, don't come in here. You don't need to know this. You don't need to learn this. Why? You'll know who you are and we can't get you money. <laughs> That's the truth. That's exactly what they do. So he says the fact, the fact Joseph, Joseph represents the imagination, the faculty as a power to throw onto the screen of visibility and substance and life forms every idea the mind can possibly conceive. Matter of fact, some people say to think it and to believe it is to manifest it. But you've got to think it first, you know. And sometimes the things that you think, you don't want to believe because you will manifest it. You don't want that, right? So uh, 
As a man think of Proverbs, right? So he is. While the imagination is a very necessary faculty and is powerful and productive, yet it is, be, it is belittled and often derided and scorned by our other faculties of the mind while they are unawakened spiritually. And this is true. While they are, while they are functioning in intellectual consciousness instead of true spiritual understanding. So and that goes on to tell a whole lot more about him. But let me read on right here. Uh, that's Joseph. Chapter 37, verse 5, Joseph dreamed a dream. Here's another dream that we got. He dreamed a dream and he told his brethren and they hated him for it. Just drop down quickly to verse 9. And he dreamed yet another dream and he told his brethren and he said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more and behold the sun, which is his father, and the moon, which represents his mother, and, his eleven, and the eleven stars, which represents his eleven brothers, made obeisance to me. Now, anybody can look at this and realize this is astrological will. This dream is about astrology. Everything in this dream is about astrology and is showing you the astrological will and how it works. This dream is about that. Why? Because when, even when you're sleeping at night, the sun and the moon is still working to do its job in your being. And it's doing it through, through avenues and through means that we can't see. It's called energy. It's, it's, it's in this room. You know, how many of you have ever been in a place or in a state, especially in a worship place, and all of a sudden you felt something just, whew, rushed across you, but you didn't see anything? And it wasn't the fan wasn't blowing. The air conditioner wasn't actually blowing. But you, what did you? Wow. Well, and you know, we say it's on, I felt the brush of angels' wings. I mean, I know it's happened to you. It's happened to me. It happens to us constantly. Why? Because there are, there are powers, there are energies that you don't see. They're still present. The breath that we're breathing in this room right now is an energy. You can't see it. But my God, if they sucked it all out of here, you'd want <laughs> you'd, be gasping, you'd be gasping for it. You'd be knocking a window down or a door down to get out there where you can get some of it, right? And so they got mad at it. Verse 10, it says, And he told it to his father and his brethren, and his father rebuked him, and he said unto him, What is in this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brethren indeed come, come bow down ourselves to you on the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father paid attention. Observed what he said. Listen to what he said. You know what? And of course, you know the story. If you don't know the story, the story is a phenomenal. It's as good as the, uh, the story of Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. In Dorothy's dream, in her dream, she dreamed the dream. In her dream, where was she going? She was going to the, the city of Oz. She was going to the Crystal City. And what did she find when she got to the Crystal City? Nothing other than anything and everything she looked for she already had it in her before she ever laid on that bed to go to sleep in her dream. Watch it again. I promise you, watch it again. Because at the end, the characters in that movie, even the characters represent many different facets of your physical being. What is the dog's name? Toto? Toto represents your conscious, your higher consciousness. Because Toto is kept trying to tell Dorothy, he said, look, the guy over there behind the curtain is really pulling the strings on the screen. The, the, the things on the screen are facade. It's the same way religion is done, you and me. They're not true. And so finally, Dorothy listened to her higher conscience. Toto. <laughs> I think it was Toto. Isn't it Toto? Yeah. Toto. Toto. She listened to that. And she looked and she realized, oh, she, so she went back to where she come from. Okay. Let me uh, quickly jump over to the book of Daniel. Not going to take a lot of time. I'm just wanting to point out dreams, and that, that these are they're through Scripture. But go with me to the book of Daniel, chapter two, and I'm going to get into these dreams and show you the breakdown of these dreams. I did I did it some last week because uh, when we when we really start to understand these dreams, all of these dreams that were 
dreamed by these different characters, whether it's whether it's Joseph or any of the others, they all have to do with this. Uh, let me put this Yod. This is the Hebrew glyph. Uh, Yod. Hey. That's the Hebrew glyph. Wow. And hey. Which actually, these, this got, this is what was called the unpronounceable word, and the reason it was in ancient Hebrew, because it was not supposed to be pronounced. It wasn't supposed to have vowel points put in. They put vowel points in, but it wasn't supposed to have vowel points in. It, but, but they added them. Why? Well, because it stood for something. It stood for carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. It stood for earth. Uh, it stood for uh, fire, fire, earth, air, and water. When you put all of these different things together in the astrological wheel, in their proper places, fit perfectly just like pieces of a puzzle. I mean, it just, it's just impossible to really argue. It would just really be foolish to try to argue and say these things don't fit here. They do fit there. They're perfectly, they perfectly are joined in these different places. So here we have in Daniel chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed a dream. And the, this, this, is, this is very interesting because when we get into Nebuchadnezzar and Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach and Abednego, we begin to see some different characters and qualities about this whole story. Again, putting this story back in its proper place of symbols, allegories, types and shadows, if we do that and we go back and we start to study and understand the names, the places, the characters, the events, it begins to take on a whole different meaning. And Nebuchadnezzar dreamed the dream, and y'all remember the story? He went out, and who did he pick to help interpret the, the dream? He picked Daniel. Isn't that right? And the word actually Daniel in Hebrew means to clear or to penetrate the insight of the Spirit. So what is he doing? What's Nebuchadnezzar doing? He's looking for clear or clarity about the dream, and he's looking to penetrate it or pierce it by the Spirit so he can find really what it's saying, what it's doing. And of course, that's an admonition to each one of us. But let's go over, and you remember, you remember the, the, the dream. It's broken down into four... Uh, Broken down into four uh, parts, right? Gold, silver, etc. The others one you look for back here? Yeah. Right there on the left. Right there on the left, or right here in the corner. So, so let's uh, let's just read some of this. Here's his dream, verse 31. No, verse 36. Come all the way down to verse 36. This is the dream. And we will tell the interpretation there before the king. Thou, O king, art the king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Whithersoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, the fowls of the air and heaven shall be given unto you under your hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. Then verse 39, he says, And after you will arise another kingdom inferior, which is silver. Uh, the third kingdom of brass uh, shall bear rule over the earth. And uh, verse 40, it says, And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. And of course, you remember that kingdom was iron and clay broken up. So that was the picture of it. <laughs> has nothing to do with the prophecy or that in the end time that Jesus is going to come back and he's going to break the kingdom down. He's going to weaken the king in his feet of clay and iron and cause the whole thing to crumble kill everybody on the earth that don't bow down and worship him take his sword and drive it through all of them it'd be a mass murder a bloody kill everybody's going to go and then God will burn the earth up and say okay it's fit for y'all <coughs> how we 
how we got into that and how we believe that, I don't know. I, I did preach it for a while. I did. God forgive me. But I did. I want to read you a couple of little things, and I'm just going to close with this. Uh, just a couple of things from this little booklet. This is uh, Pope Leo X. This is just a quote from Pope Leo X, who, Leo from 1475 to 1521. He says this, How well we know of what a profitable superstition this fable of Christ has been for us. That's what the Pope said. They knew that uh, they had really deceived the minds of people. Uh, the Bible, let me back up here. Symbolism is the art of expressing or representing cosmic powers, principles, processes, and products by the use of signs and symbols. A symbol may represent an object, a figure, a type, as a lion is the symbol of fierceness, which is the symbol of purity. A scepter may represent the symbol of power, and an all-seeing eye, the symbol of omniscience. So, you know, you can kind of see how these, all symbols are important. And the Bible is a book of symbols. The Bible, confused, the Bible confuses the clergy and the lay because it is a book of symbol and allegory, which can be interpreted only by him who knows the substance of the master's teaching and is an expert in astrology, biology, physiology, psychology, and anatomy. And all true science is related to cosmic principles and processes as they are individualized and manifested in the microcosm, or in other words, this arena where you and I live. The Bible is a book of these symbols and allegories, but with many spurious inner pollutions and distortions as the church fathers in their attempt to make the Bible say what the ancient masters did not teach. So muddied up the water and confused the reader. Uh, this is Professor Hilton Holtema that I'm reading from, in case you, any of you wonder where I got that. And he, is, he will literally blow your mind way out of the water. So, so I'm just going to close right here, but I want to just close with this, saying this, because really what I'm talking about are dreams. And I'm not just talking about the dreams of the things that you experience in your sleep, even though I am talking about that. I'm talking about the dreams that you have for your life. And I pray that you do have dreams. You call them visions or goals, I hope. And those are things of aspiration that you want to go to. But I want to say this, that these, these characters that dream these dreams, the common element in these dreams is the astrological wheel. And in the astrological wheel is the ineffable word or the unknown word. And that unknown word is said this way. In John 1.1, 1, 1, you can all, you can all uh, quote that. You don't even have to go there and look, look at it. I can just quote it but just so that I have every King James dot and tittle crossed and dotted. Uh, I will just read it directly. In the beginning was the word the Word was with God and the Word was God. For you to know you, you have to know God. If you don't know God, you don't know come here from Sikkim about you. But if you think God is an old gray-headed man out there in the sky in a place called heaven trying to draw you to himself, you don't know God. God can better be described by the astrological wheel and the Word that's not pronounceable the word that's in the beginning is this, this yod hey vav hey. That is the word of God because this is God. This is El. This is the power. And that power is empowering you right now to live, to breathe, to move, and to have your being. It's constantly with you, never leads you, never judges you, never condemns you for what you are or who you have become. Why? It is totally Pure love. 
And that's why we have such a hard time grasping it. That we don't realize how much God loves me. We don't understand how this embrace is on my life that's pulling me to it to be more like it. Less like my lower self. So that I can think with a divine mind and I can have the dreams of this energy system and realize that the Word, not just the things I'm speaking out of my mouth, not just that, I mean, that's important. Those are seeds spewed. Those are seeds sown. But the Word being that energy system that constantly energizes me so that I can be a stronger, more productive me. Hallelujah. With that embrace, and I realize that and I know that, it transforms my walk. Changes my mind. I don't see people, do I? The way I used to, Barb. I don't. I see them through the eyes of this character that says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, you can't find that in oh, Christianity or religion. They don't forgive. Why? Because, bless their heart, they're blinded by the condemnation of a religious system that had pulled us off, pulled me into it. I mean, I bought hook, line, and sinker for a while, even though it didn't make sense. And I kept arguing with Dave, said, that, that don't make good sense. Paul Pullery, when you guys too many questions. But I wanted to know. The story that Beverly told us before she sang her song this morning, she was totally blessed for God to, to reveal that to her as soon as it, you know, had already taken place. And God revealed it. A lot of us have to live that life that we have just condemned somebody in to learn that lesson so that we don't judge them in things that happen. So, I mean, that was just a real blessing for God to come and say, hey, look, this is what I want you to do. You know, this is how it is. That was beautiful. All of y'all. All of y'all. That was just beautiful. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, if I, you know, if I if I could do something or say something that could help people to realize it's all about them, life is about them, that sounds so selfish. I used to think that sounds so selfish. But actually, it's selfless. It really begins to empower you to know who you are. And not only it empowers you, it empowers you to be who you're really built and designed to be. Not the false self that most of us get caught. I, I get caught in my false self. All, I mean, a lot. A lot more than I wish I did. If you love yourself, people think you're conceited. Mm. But, man, yeah. if you know who you are, you're going to love yourself. Mm. Amen. Don't stop condemning yourself and thinking you're so weak. You know, you're so weak and stuff. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Anybody else? Let's go eat. Yeah.